I guess to begin a little bit about myself briefly, it's just I graduated this past year from Columbia University, and then I am currently at UCSF doing full-time research post back um, in hopes to go to graduate school. Um, and the name of my paper is called Reconceptualizing Brain Fog, Assessing Electroencephalography and Mood Dynamics in Long COVID Patients. Um, so to begin, what is brain fog? Um, it is, brain fog is a symptom that ha existed prior to COVID and it has been brought into common discourse by COVID-19. So it's often defined by cognitive complaints like forgetfulness, as you see, concentration difficulties, uh, attention problems, and as we'll see a little bit later, slowed processing speed. And these qualities can severely diminish um, quality of life and daily functioning. And they're especially prevalent in long COVID. So what is long COVID? Um, it is a condition in which COVID symptoms persist long after the acute infection has resolved. And according to the CDC, this is when uh, the sim your symptoms are present for more than three months post initial infection. And a meta-analysis by Premraj et al. Uh, demonstrated that brain fog as a post-COVID symptom had a 32% prevalence rate. So that's pretty dramatic. And despite this common occurrence, the physiological and psychological correlates of brain fog still remain poorly understood. So my research paper, um, what was I trying to do? Um, I wanted to explore how current conceptualizations of brain fog are overlooking critical factors that traditional cognitive tests, such as the matrix cognitive battery, fail to capture. Um, and how did I go about this? By examining neurophysiological changes via EEG and mood dynamics, we can form a more complete picture that integrates people's lived experiences with objective data. And why did I do this? Um, I thought, you know, this enhanced understanding of brain fog associated factors uh, could facilitate the development of comprehensive post-infection care and targeted rehabilitation strategies. So this is just a little flow chart of the study uh, that I kind of, um, and working on. And on the left-hand side, there's two cohorts, um, a neuro COVID, which are our long COVID patients. And then in the middle, the COVID controls. So the neuro COVIDs are long COVID patients who are endorsing um, neurological symptoms like difficulty concentrating, um, having trouble paying attention, things like that. And our COVID controls are people who have had COVID and they feel fully recovered and normal now, like probably a lot of people in this meeting. Um, and then they come in for a study visit, and that's where they'll do neuropsychological testing, an EEG recording, and then they also completed self-report questionnaires. And if you look on the right-hand side, we have a pre-pandemic healthy control cohort, and that is EEG data that was collected from a previous research study prior to the pandemic to ensure that none of those individuals had COVID, because it's kind of impossible to do that now, or it'd be more expensive to recruit people who definitely didn't have COVID post-pandemic. So my paper's preliminary hypotheses were that the long COVID patients would, one, perform worse on the neuropsych test compared to COVID controls and the overall population norm. They would exhibit slower EEG-based event-related potentials compared to COVID controls and the pre-pandemic healthy controls. And that three, they would report significantly greater depression and anxiety compared to COVID controls. So my first hypothesis, that they would perform worse on the cognitive tests, um, they actually proved not to. Um, it didn't. They didn't significantly differ on this, um, and that's not entirely surprising. Um, there's been prove that's kind of consistent with previous research findings that long COVID patients reporting concentration and memory difficulties do not show object objective deficits in cognitive performance. And actually, surprisingly, the long COVID um, patients perform significantly better on the working memory tasks despite reporting these like subjective cognitive decline. So that was a little surprising, but um, uh, this kind of just underscores the discrepancy in people's subjective experiences and their objective performance on these cognitive tests. And that's why to better understand this discrepancy, ERPs um, offer a more promising avenue for further exploration of brain fog. So we examined the um, event related, uh, P300 event related potential using an auditory task. And participants were presented with a combination of standard, novel, and target tones. 
And essentially, the P300 is a neurophysiological index of processing speed. So it peaks about 300 milliseconds after the onset of a tone. And we select these peaks by picking the most positive peak within um, the time window. And for my paper, I was looking at P300 latency, which reflects neural processing speed in milliseconds. And this is the time in which it takes for your brain to process the sound. So not that it's registering it heard something, but you're processing what you just heard. And then we also looked at reaction time, which is an additional thing. So you have the neural processing speed, and then you add in that physical motor response to execute the press. Um, and uh, for this, um, it actually proved that if you look at figure one, both the long COVID and COVID controls had significantly slower P300s than the pre-pandemic healthy controls. And there was no significant difference between the long COVIDs and the COVID controls. So this difference is not significant, but compared to the pre-pandemic cohort, that's where there's, you're seeing significantly slower reaction uh, processing speed, I should say, because P300, just to remind you, equals neural speed, and neural speed is slower in people who had COVID. And then we also looked at reaction time, and this was also significantly slower in the long COVID and COVID controls. And so delayed reaction times reflect both motor plus neural slowing. And just one thing to note with both of these figures is that because our pre-pandemic healthy controls um, are younger because they were recruited from a previous research study, we statistically removed the effects of normal aging from the COVID subjects data, which is why in both of these figures, you see that the legacies are at um, zero. So basically anything, any significant changes that we're seeing is a pathological aging, what you would, um, changes or slowing that's beyond what we would expect for normal aging processes. And the, these findings highlight the sensitivity of electrophysiological and reaction time measures in revealing the lasting impact of COVID on cognitive processing speed. And then my third hypothesis was that they would report significantly greater depression and anxiety compared to the controls. And this is this was something that was quite strong in what we saw. Um, so as hypothesized, the long COVIDs were significantly more depressed and more anxious since having COVID. You see that in the left two bars. And then they also reported a lot more difficulty moving around and having a harder time doing usual activities. And those two components are also just daily life functioning measures that are often affected by depression. Um, and this is all relative to the COVID control patients. So this association between long COVID and this like greater depression and anxiety underscore the significant disruption to their daily well-being, like overall well-being and daily functioning. Um, okay, and then summary of my paper was just that the EEG results indicate persistent neurological alterations despite the absence of observed cognitive deficits at a quantitative level. The P300 ERP, as well as the reaction time measures, emerges as a promising tool for the early detection of cognitive dysfunction related to long COVID because it is a much more sensitive measure, particularly, particularly in cognitive neuroscience than like structural MRI or neuropsychological testing. You'll, um, you'll might see changes sooner with um, electrophysiological recordings. And then the increased depression and anxiety in long COVID patients highlight the broader psychological impact of this condition beyond cognitive domains. So future longitudinal studies are essential to investigate whether these observed abnormalities in long COVID patients persist over time or revert back to pre-pandemic levels. And what my paper was trying to get at was just saying, you know, brain fog should not be tied to cognitive challenges alone, as is often seen in the literature, but rather encompass anomalies across biological and psychological domains. And this holistic approach will promise to advance our understanding and treatment of brain fog, aiming to improve the quality of life for those affected by these debilitating COVID effects. Um, and my last page is just my acknowledgements. I just wanted to say thank you to the Brain Imaging and EEG Lab at UCSF for allowing me to be part of this project. Um, and then also doc a big thank you to Dr. Jessica Hua. Um, she mentored me throughout the writing process of this paper. So that was really invaluable for me. <laughs> and that's that's it. <laughs>